written production of the recreation centers of Sun City Incorporated and is intended for the sole purpose of informing our recreation center members. Any duplication, copying, transmission, broadcast or use including electronic and social media is strictly prohibited without the prior written consent from the recreation centers of Sun City Incorporated. Thank you for watching. I'd like to welcome everybody to the second of the two candidate forums for this year. Um, we're gonna do things a little bit different than we did on Monday, just so that that way we can get hopefully some more questions from the audience. But for now, if I could get everybody that's here to stand up for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please be seated. Also, if you would, you would please turn off your cell phones, put it to silent or buzz, but please shut it off. Okay. All righty. Um, my name is Connie Jo Rickmeyer. I am the co-chair of the Elections Committee. Uh, my... Okay, let's see here. As I said, this is the second of the two candidate forums. The first one was on Monday afternoon. We have six candidates vying for three three-year terms and two one-year terms. Okay, as I said before, please silence your cell phone if you haven't done so already. I will try to remember to tell you to turn it back on. I forgot yesterday, so... I'll try. Okay, I would like to introduce to you the chair of our elections committee, uh, RCSC director Karen McAdam. She's in the back. Okay, and then um, board members that we have today, we have, uh, I saw him, but I, Steve Collins? Ah, okay, Steve Collins. Um, Preston Kais, uh, Karen McAdam, Kat Fimmel, we also have Anita Borsky, we have Tom Foster, we have Chris Nettesheim, and myself, and did I miss anybody? I think I got everyone. Okay, um, I would like to introduce the election committee members that are present. Tom Marone is, has graciously been drafted to be our timekeeper for the second time. Please thank Tom. Okay, uh, Jean Buck is unavailable. Connie Sherman. Okay, and Mike Wendell, I saw him, he's back by, back by desserts, makes sense. Okay, all right, so, ah, I'm sorry, and our wonderful board executive assistant who is great at herding cats, Marsha Johnson in the back. She's the one who brought the treats, so make sure that you get one if you haven't gotten one. All righty. Um, Yes, on Monday, I opened up with a question after we had them give opening statements. I think we have enough people tonight. Um, in order to help expedite things, we're going to just cancel my question and just open it up to the floor. Let's see here. So, so first, let me give you kind of the basic rules and what we're going to do if, you know, so that way everybody understands and we're all on the same playing field. We will have opening statements from our candidates. Anyone with a question may come up to the podium and ask your question. Anyone with a second question should wait until after everyone who is interested in having a chance to ask a question, wait, and if there is time, additional questions will be allowed. We ran out of time yesterday. We will be taking questions only until eight o'clock, so two hours. At eight o'clock, we have a lovely pianist that's going to give us a beautiful serenade for half an hour, but that also opens it up for, for you to be able to socialize a little bit with the candidates and ask quite additional questions if you want. Okay, questions may be directed to a specific candidate or to all the candidates for response. I would like, if it's okay, we'll have the candidates raise if they want to raise their hand if they want to answer a question, because otherwise it takes like 12 minutes, 12 minutes to get through one question if everybody answers it. So we'll try that, but I have no objections if everybody wants to ans answer a question. Okay, straight questions should be straightforward and to the point, no preamble. Okay, to make it so it's designed to get the candidate's view on how they would function as a board member. Each candidate will have two minutes to respond to the questions. 
If the questions are asked are not fair or appropriate, I will withdraw the question or ask that it be reworded accordingly. Okay, when a question is asked of all candidates, I will call on them to respond in random order. See? Um, and if, let's see here, in order to respond, the forum is scheduled, as I said, for two hours. If members are finished with their questions early, which did not happen on Monday, we will allow each candidate their, to give their closing statements and we will adjourn early. As I said, there'll be a 30 minute after the forum for members to visit with the candidates. If we don't get to many questions from the floor, I have some questions that are, have we've prepared to make sure that that there are some interesting questions out there for the candidates to address. At this time, I would like to start with opening statements from your candidates. Each candidate will have two minutes to, to introduce themselves, and let's start with Chris Nettesheim. Good evening, everybody. My name is Chris Nettesheim, and I'm running for the board for next year, 2025. Um, we're a second generation Sun City family. We've been actively engaged with Sun City since 87 when my in-laws moved here. Um, we inherited their house down on Andover and then when we were ready to move in ourselves, we sold that and purchased a house off of Saraband Way. Um, we have seen what Sun City has been through the years from 1987 to now. Um, so we've seen the different cycles that Sun City have gone through and some of the challenges that the community has faced when it comes to making some of their biggest decisions. Um, me personally, I worked for Progressive Insurance for 27 years. I was on their business side handling insurance, so I know a lot about insurance, but I also was on the IT side, so I know an awful lot about it, uh, IT and technology, and that is my passion. At the IT technology side. I feel everywhere I have been, I have been involved in the community and volunteered my services to the community. I feel strongly that being engaged and being involved is really important. So that is why when in April um, the opportunity came to serve on the board, I volunteered my name and I was selected. I have learned a lot in the nine months that I have been on the board. Um, it has been very, a very engaging, challenging, and interesting experience that I would like to continue. Thank you. John? Good evening. My name is John Brissett, and just so that you know, prior to coming here, I was sitting on my backyard and looking out on the 16th fairway. My wife came out with a glass of wine, and I said, that is not fair, okay? <laughs> And I'm sure many of you would like to be there. So anyways, my name is John Brissett. I uh, grew up in a small town in New Hampshire called Keene, New Hampshire. And I went to a military college named Norwich University, which the gentleman here may know about. And uh, when I graduated from there, I went in the military. I did a career in the military, and then I got out, retired in 1998. After that, I decided to go to work. I got go to work for the California Department of Food and Agriculture where I uh, managed two different licensing units in California. The uh, producers are pretty well protected against the processors. And the first one I did was fruits and vegetables. And then for the last seven years of my career, I did the uh, milk. Milk is a big commodity in California and the processors and the producers again have a big fight. During that time, I was sent to Pepperdine University, where I got a certification in dispute resolution, which is arbitration and mediation. And having been around here for the last few years, I think that's a pretty good thing to have. Okay. Uh, anyways, uh, we bought a house here in uh, 2013, retired. I went uh, 2014. I was sitting in my office, and I called the secretary of the agriculture, and I said, I'm retiring on Thursday. She laughed and hung up. Friday I was gone, so I left Thursday. Just was, decided it was time to move. Move on, got here, and I've enjoyed it. I came here because it's such a great community. Uh, I like to golf, I'm no good. You can ask Tom. But uh, I joined it because it's a lot of fun here, a lot of things to do, uh, community is involved, and it's a you know. Oh, wow. Thank you very much. Hey, it didn't take that long for the first time, okay? That's okay. <laughs> Rick? 
Thank you, my name is Rick Gray. Uh, my wife Lisa and I moved down here in, uh, in 2006, the spring actually, it took us until the end of that year to find a house because that's when the big fall was, economic fall. Um, so we, we bought our house at the end of, or got our house at the end of uh, 2006. We worked on it, remodeling it, and then I uh, started a small plumbing company. I was actually looking for one to buy, uh, but there wasn't any that was really worth it. So we, we started a small company uh, doing that in 2007. 2008, we had uh, a big uh, push from the Homeowners Association because they had more openings for board positions than they had candidates. And so I thought, well, you know, we got a great community. I was, I was retired. I, I'd had a 24-7, 365 plumbing company before, uh, and I decided, yeah, yeah, I've got the time. I will put my name in, and um, there were four seats and four of us running, so I, I squeezed into that election and got elected. Uh, but that, that was where I really, I became the government fair, affairs chair and I really began to see where our county supervisor and our legislators are critical to protect our community. And it was so much and so that when in 2010, when we were gonna have an open seat in the House of Representatives and there wasn't a, uh, somebody that was running that I thought I had confidence in to really look out for our community. I talked with my wife and I, because when you go into politics, it's a, it's a dual sport. She pays as much price as I do. Uh, and she agreed, so I ran. I was elected in 2010 and started serving in 2011. Uh, during that time, I, I was in the legislature for a decade. I was in the House and the Senate. Uh, we worked a lot to kill certain bills that would have been very bad as well as support bills that would have been very good for us. Uh, one of the bills I shared uh, the last time was there was actually a bill that was focused on HOAs that had 25, 50 homes and they said you have to send a letter for every meeting that you're gonna have in the mail to every member. Well, SHOA has, boy, that was fast. <laughs> well, I, I, I think Tom's quicker tonight than Thank he was the other day. No, mm -mm. He's, he's got it right on. Thank you, Rick. Tom? Well, my name is Tom Foster, and I did not realize the gentlemen to my right were such stand-up comedians, um, <laughs> so good for them. Um, so I'm Tom Foster. My wife and I uh, also purchased a home here around 2006. We became full-time uh, home or full-time residents in 2012, and um, I was appointed to the uh, to a. a a seat that had been, uh, had a, an unfulfilled term in March of, of this year, 2024, and then was, was elected president of the board in September. Uh, I've served on greens committees, I've been on the finance and budget committee, uh, long range planning committee, um, insurance committee, and investment uh, commission. Um, my term will expire at the end of 2024, so I'm here to run to extend that uh, time on the board if I can, because I feel like I'm able to bring some financial discipline to the RCSC budget, some prudent spending of our capital funds, and some common sense decision making. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anita? Hi everyone, um, I'm Anita Borski and I'm running for the board. I'm just finishing my first one year term. On the board, I am the treasurer. I'm active in the club organization committee. I'm the vice president of the foundation and I am the li liaison for Sun City Can and the museum. At the beginning of the year, I was uh, co-chair of the finance committee and co-chair of the Outreach and Communication Committee, but Tom came and we needed to give him something to do, and Chris was the same way, so they each took over those roles. Um, I come from a background of higher education. I worked at a university in Wisconsin, University of Wisconsin-Stevens Point, for 37 years, and I was pretty much involved in um, finance, uh, cash handling, collections, did some liability work, read, reviewed contracts, I had a pretty wide background. I, I've done everything from being on a team to hire a chancellor to working with the governor on some different projects. Um, my um, 
education is in communication and corporate communication and public relations, so, which has absolutely nothing to do with finances where I worked my whole life. But um, it, I don't know why I got where I got. My husband and I came here in 2008 to visit a friend, a high school friend, and we got here on Friday and bought a house on Sunday. Uh, loved it here. We were snowbirds for many years and we moved here permanently in 2019. And I plan, this is my home, I plan to be here forever. I enjoy my time on the board. It's not the easiest job I've ever had. I've learned things that I never thought I ever needed to know. And, uh, but I love it. I love what I'm doing and I hope I can continue. Thank you very much. Mike? Good evening. I'm Mike Eggie. A little bit about me and my background. Born and raised Southern California. <clears throat> uh, my first job was in the uh, aerospace business. I was a manufacturing engineer de designing workspaces, processes, and doing a lot of documentation. Then I moved to the southeastern part of the country and uh, worked nearly 30 years in professional motorsports and uh, was fortunate enough to visit Victory Lane and uh, I guess you'd say the majority of the uh, bigger, more well-known racetracks. And uh, when that came to an end, I headed back west and have some family here in the Phoenix area. And next thing you know, I'm in Sun City. And the more I hung around Sun City with my parents, the, the more I figured out it was a pretty cool place to be. Uh, I have served on the board previously, um, 2020 through 2022, and uh, served on numerous committees. I won't bother to rattle them all off because I'm not sure I can remember all of them. But anyway, the, uh, uh, currently I'm working at Honeywell uh, Aerospace Technologies, working on some pretty cool uh, government-based and uh, military-based projects. So it keeps my mind going and makes me feel young because I'm hanging out with all these young engineering people. But uh, anyway, looking forward to serving another three years on the board. I feel like I've got more to accomplish. and. Uh, my main focus all along while I served on the board was communications, working, trying to figure out how to get the word out about what we do here at Sun City and trying to figure out how to make it a better place to live. So thank you. Thank you. Okay, as I said on Monday, I opened up with the opening question, but uh, for the sake of time, who would like to step up first and ask a question? Okay, the, gen the gentleman there behind you. Okay, then you'll be next, sir, okay? Thank you very much. Uh, Ray Sheel, uh, member number 171651. You don't need to do member number. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank, thank, you. thank you, though. That's for board me formal meetings. You got it. Um, question for everybody. In your experience, whether it be career or committee work, how can you cite a time uh, a situation that you had to handle a disagreement or differing perspectives, and how did you handle that specific situation? Thank you for that. Let's lead off with Anita. Okay, as I said, I worked at a university and uh, worked with the students a lot. I was the nasty old lady that sent out the tuition bills. I also managed the parking department, so all the parking fines were my responsibility. I had a lot of students uh, lose their temper, and I, what I learned is just just let them lose their temper. Sooner or later, they'll stop for a breath, and at that point, I could sit with them and try to explain what was happening, why it was happening, or what they could do about it. Thank you. Okay, uh, Mike. Well, working in professional motorsports for again nearly 30 years. One of the things you learn to deal with is opposition and sometimes stubborn egos and that kind of thing. And of course, the typical uh, technical challenges that you're trying to overcome. So one of the things I pride myself on is getting people together, typically people that are better than I am or smarter than I am, and making everybody be part of the, helping everybody to be part of the solution. Uh, I do a lot of listening, uh, a lot of analysis, and then at some point in time you have to step back and, and 
start making some decisions or offering some uh, some ideas and some guidance to help get problems solved. So that's my approach. Okay. Thank you, Mike. Chris? Uh, as a, the senior program test lead at Progressive, when we were building a data center, we had to work with the engineers, and the engineers were very used to doing their own quality checks, and I was head of the quality department. And what ended up happening was that, of course, the engineers didn't want to try anything new. They were used to their status quo. So I worked with our other senior test leads and some of our managers got the engineers together, walked step by step the value added and the improvements that they would see by adopting these quality practices. And then I asked for a pilot group to go ahead and pilot these practices and see if it improved quality from where it was at before. Um, it did, and by the end of our project, it was a three-year project to deliver this data center. The engineers themselves had changed their process and had incorporated those quality checks into their process and worked much more closely with the quality team. So it was a very positive outcome because we delivered the data center with no critical outages. Thank you. John? Thank you. Well, when I was in uh, working for the California Department of Food and Agriculture, as I stated, I did a lot of mediations. And that's a straight, <clears throat> the biggest ones and the hardest ones to do were with the wine industry because there's a certain degree of bricks they want, the sugar content on them, and the processor would say they're at this content, this, and the producer and the uh, producer would show his side of what it was. The processor would show theirs, and by the time they actually picked, those numbers may be different. So the contract states one thing, and if the grapes aren't, weren't exactly the way they were, then they still wanted the grapes, but they didn't want to pay for them. So it was a matter of having to. Many times, you, I brought them both in. We took the contracts. I went to our attorney for the estate. Uh, asked him his you know, legal opinion on it first, and sat them down, made them sit right beside, right in front of each other, and I sat in the middle, and we discussed it out. And I don't remember any one time either side was, oh boy, I won, but I think they were both accepting at the end that there was only a happy medium. And you either get there or you're not gonna get it, and if we had to change it to arbitration, then I was the one who had to decide which way to go. And that wasn't always easy either, but I did it a lot of times. And uh, it was fun, it really was. Because people, when they sit down beside each other, look each other in the face to face, it's a different situation than it is in an email. So I enjoyed doing that. Thank you. Thank you. Rick? Yeah, most of my uh, business background, uh, I, I ran my own company, so that really made it nice. I made decisions, and that was it. Um, my biggest growth area uh, was when I got into the legislature because you don't just make decisions, you have to get consensus. And we'd had a, a lot of different issues that, where we needed to get a solution on a bill or an issue, uh, and we had, uh, again, in politics, you've got strong opposition on, on all sides. Uh, and that's where, again, we would pull together and we'd say, we need to get a stakeholder meeting. We would get every perspective on it and comes down to pretty much like Mike was talking about. You get, you get as much data and information as you can get, and then you come to a conclusion of what's the best avenue to take. And so that's my focus is you got to be data driven. You got to, and not only data driven, but look out for what's good for everybody. A lot of times you get a lot of uh, groups that may have a strong, loud, vocal group that make a lot of noise, but they're not really working for what's best for the community or the state. And so I think that's a part of that decision making too, especially on a board like this. You have to look out for who, who are the people that aren't here, and we can see there's a lot of them, uh, what's, what's, what's advantageous for them and what isn't. And so I think, again, it's, it's a process of getting all the data and then making the decision of what's, what's best for the whole. Thank you. Tom? Well, a lot of what's already been said is, is good advice. Um, I think in my work experience and some, some degree my current experience on this board, 
is that when you have situations where there's um, conflict and adversarial nature, sometimes folks are not all in a rational mindset. And it's hard to negotiate and find a consensus, as Rick was talking about, if not everyone is in a rational mindset. And so one of the things that I have often used as a technique to try and to reach conclusions is get everybody to a rational point of view. And I have done that by not making statements, but asking questions to try and draw people from an emotional state to an rational state. And that tends to work pretty well. You can find consensus, I think, when you start to force people to give, the, give their points of view and, and their reasons for why they're having an, an issue. And, and at the end, hopefully you reach a point where instead of there being problems, you're finding solutions. Thank you. Sir, you are next, and do you want to ask this question of everybody, or can we have them raise their hand and answer if they choose? I want a short answer from everybody, but it's short. Okay. My name is Jim Stark. lived here for 28 plus years as a full-time resident. Uh, but I just have one question, and I'd like a yes or no answer from each of our candidates here. Tomorrow there's a meeting on which, in which they're going to vote on the PAC. If you were to vote, if you were on that board tomorrow, knowing what you know now, would you vote yes for the PAC or would you vote no for the PAC? Sir, I'm sorry, that question is not allowed because they, not everyone has the same information. Do you want to ask a different question? Nope. Okay. If you can't answer it, you can't. I'm sorry. Okay, was there anybody else that would like to step up next? You guys are being a little polite tonight, which is nice, but. <laughs> By the way, I preface that with what they know now. I understand that, but I gotta make it even. Fair, go ahead, ma'am. Okay, I have a question for Mike Agee. Okay. Nobody else has to answer. <laughs> uh, Mike, I remember when you were on the board in uh, June of 2021, and you and several other board members at the last minute did not back Mountain View Design 1, and all of a sudden came up with a completely different design without notifying the other board members or involving other member input. I'm wondering if you've learned anything from that maneuver, would you do anything differently now? Well, okay, that's easy. Th that maneuver was actually Steve Collins' idea. Uh, he came up with a really good idea to turn the main center building 90 degrees to enhance the parking. So that became the second design option that was discussed openly and voted on right here on the stage to adopt. And I still brag about Steve's great job and vision of being able to see, just turn the building 90 degrees. That's all we did. No. Okay. Okay, thank you. Next person. Hi, first of all, I'd like to say it's very hard making a decision amongst you. You are all very good. My name is Jay Ferris, 10647 West Coggins Drive. Uh, I'm targeting one thing. I have a neighbor who is seriously underage for the age limit you're supposed to be to live here. Sir, that's, that would be SHOA, that would not be the rec No, I've been to SHOA and they won't do anything. Okay, but that we are- They told me to come to you. No, no, you, I mean, that you may try Maricopa County, but... I've been to Maricopa County, they won't do anything either. That's why I want to know what their opinion is about a situation they're going to have to deal with. It's not their purview, sir, if whether they're on, if they were on this well, board... Well, whose purview is it if it's not the board of Sun City? Because we're, it's the rec centers of Sun City, that's what the board is. It has nothing to do with Well, I've residents. been to everywhere and nobody will deal with it. They always send me to somebody else. So I thought maybe the people that are running for the board might have an opinion about it. Um, I, I wish, oh, wait a second. Okay, I have somebody who chooses to answer. Anita? Okay. I understand your frustration. Um, the, the board here manages all of the rec centers and golf courses. So we can't help you with a housing issue. I think if you go back to Showa, 
which is the Homeowners Association, and that is the group that uh, enforces the CCRs. They would be the people that you would have to report that to, and they would have to take action. They sent me to the board. Um, I'm sorry, that was a that was a mistake. They should not have done that because we don't do that. Okay, um, I have one more person I'd like to respond, Rick. Yes, thank you. Uh, and I've been. Um, I've actually termed out several times on the show of board, uh, so I'm very familiar with that. And again, for full disclosure, my wife is a general manager. There, we, I can guarantee you, we will, we will not send you, SHOA will not send you to the rec center to deal with the underage. One of the things that some people don't understand is that SHOA doesn't have a magic wand that we can just wave it. We have a process that we have to go through and the underage is a challenging process. Over the years that I've been involved, there have been on the board, when I was on the board, there have been hundreds of underage cases and we fought them and struggled and we've maintained our age overlay because of the work of SHOA. But, but there's just no way that we can just say, okay, so-and-so says this, so that's the way it is and we can just take over. So it's, it's a process. And, and we cannot guarantee that SHOA is gonna be able to have instant solutions just like if somebody complains about weeds, it's a process. And so uh, one of the things that SHOA does is they, they highly prioritize age overlay. You may not see that, you may not appreciate that. Okay, I think that, okay. I, I do think we need to stop because we need okay, to focus on our CSC. All right, um, somebody else would like to come forward? Okay, Linda. John, if you want, why don't you scoot up front? Okay, my question is for Rick. Um, you've commented at previous forum, and now we just talked about SHOA, uh, about the need for better communication between SHOA and our CSC. If elected, what steps do you think should be taken to improve the working relationship between the two organizations, and how could you see or would you see that implemented? Thank you for the question. Uh, yeah, I, I think communication is key, and having that communication, uh, Again, because I've been on the show board for so many years and I see how that organization protects our age overlay and I've seen that we've been protected by that work, it's important that an organization like the rec center is open and communicative with, with SHOA as a homeowners association. But I think it's just communication. I think we, we need to be able to have a little closer ties with that. And again, when, when the whole thing came up with the, the additional homes coming in, having that communicated, I think would have been a plus. But I think that's, that's the bottom line is communication. And even if you look at our corporate documents, it talks about being connected with other organizations. So I think that's just a part of, in essence, like neighborliness. Uh, only it's with organizations and not just individuals. So it's a Communi yeah, communication. Okay, do you want an opportunity to answer that, Tom? Just a comment, um, and, and I um, am familiar with that particular situation that Rick was just talking about, but I think we, there is some differences between the two organizations and there's reasons why they haven't um, really joined forces um, in the past, but that doesn't mean you can't have a dialogue. And, and I think we have at least opened that dialogue so that there is at least some communications between the two. But I think there is some reasons to, to continue the communication, but we have to be careful about um, any kind of merging of the two factors because I, I, I don't, that's not probably in the best interest of either one of them. Okay. All right. All right. Um, next person. Okay. John. Wow. Um, John Nowakowski, uh, I have a follow-up question for Mike, and if anyone else wants to kick in after that, that's fine. Uh, during the last uh, forum, you mentioned that on, as the previous board was very conservative and you ended up with a $6 million carry forward uh, in the budget. My question is, how did you manage to do that? How did the board manage to come up with a $6 million surplus 
out of their budget as a carry forward if they didn't do stuff? Well, I'm, not, I'm not exactly, hello. I'm not exactly sure what you're referring to as far as not doing stuff. You're talking about that doesn't matter what it is. Uh, the only way that I know that you can save $6 million out of a budget is to not spend it. There is no other way. Well, again, it was a carry forward, you know, no. month over month. It was... You didn't spend it. We didn't need to spend it. I mean, why, what, you just want to spend money Recklessly, I don't understand where you're, what you're asking. Well, there are sure many items uh, right now. Well, I, I, okay. wrong forum, wrong forum. Yeah. yeah. So I'm going to stop there. Okay. I um, have some other questions later on. You can leave if there's time. That's definitely okay. Norm, you came up closer, so I'm assuming you want to be next. I just like to be close to the board. <laughs> I've got a two-part question. Um, for each of you, you're going to be elected for three years. What, in your vision of Sun City for the future, is the most important issue facing Sun City now, and why? Okay. All right, let's go off of my list. Rick, you get to start that one off. Well, my perspective is it's a budget because it affects everything else. The budget affects the direction of where we go, how we get there, um, and, and we've obviously got some financial decisions to make, uh, but, but we have to do it to me in a way that's fiscally wise and prioritizing what's the most important thing as we're moving forward. Because we, I mean, we've already seen the uproar that people have over the increase in the assessments. And with the increase of cost of everything, I think being fiscally wise, and, and taking care of maximizing our community and what we need to do moving forward in a financial way, I think is, is a high priority. Thank you. Tom? Well, it's almost a ditto uh, in the sense that since I'm really a finance and economics type of individual um, that, you know, I, I've spent a ton of time working on trying to improve how we budget going forward. And we've, we have improved that transparency of that and the, and the ability of having members be involved, whether they're just coming to committee meetings or they're sitting on committees or they're participating in exchanges or participating at board meetings. But the idea behind the transparency, and also town halls, by the way, but the idea behind that was to have as much input as we could so that when we were talking about, for instance, Rick talks about uh, annual assessments, that shouldn't be a great surprise because there were plenty of opportunities for you to be involved and to state your opinion. And I think that's what happened. And when we had those town halls, it was not a huge surprise to those folks. So, so that's one thing, is to continue to work hard on the transparency and the, the building of those budgets. And the other thing then is, how are we going to spend the capital budgets? And we've gone a long ways there as well to build uh, a procedure where you have to go through a business case to justify it through the long range planning committee who will then make recommendations to the board so that there's, a, there's good documentation of why you want $5 million for whatever rather than to some extent, what has happened in the past is a little bit of a knee-jerk reaction of, uh, let's just, you know, do something for pickleball, or let's do something for golf, or let's do something for whatever. Thank you. All right. You're Anita, welcome. Anita, you're next. Mm. Uh, I come from a financial background as well, so I'm pretty much in the same track as Tom. Um, I think the first thing is we have to be financially responsible. And I don't know if that means um, limiting our spending, uh, uh, prioritizing our spending, 
We need to be transparent in what we're doing. I don't think we did a good job of that a few years ago, but we're getting better. Uh, we need to get our, our membership involved and so they understand what we're doing and why we're doing it. Uh, prioritizing, uh, controlling what we're spending money on is probably the best thing. Thank you. Thank you. Mike? I'll echo the comments the others have made. It, it's got to, we've got to focus on the budgets. We've got to focus on building amenities that, uh, say a facility that can be multi-use, um, not digging up a perfectly good amenity because you want to put another one somewhat arbitrarily. I mean, it, it's, we've just got to manage our money uh, we've got to build, I, I touched on this on Monday, we've got to build our facilities in such a way that they're less expensive to maintain. Uh, you know, whether it's building the building materials itself, whatever, we, we, just, we, we just can't keep spending money the way we've been doing the last couple of years. Thank you. Um, John? Thank you. Um, absolutely, you know, the budget is extremely important, but I think the way we need to get keep the budget is to work more with long-range planning so that we know where, where the people want to go. And to do that, I think it's really important that IT gets increased a little better, and so that, therefore we have a big problem with people conceive of transparency because of the rumors and all going around. And I think if we can control some of the rumors and be get news out there through the IT program so that more people would see the facts, I think we'd find it a hot, lot easier to work and to keep the budget in line because there wouldn't be any big surprises. People would see them coming. So, um, you know, it's like we have maintenance. There's a lot of maintenance that has to be done. And as you can tell, I don't have a specific. I'm trying to look at the whole problem and see how can we make it all get back together, okay? So we are working as a community and everybody is well informed, and we maintain that budget so that we can pass on this, what we have, to our kids. Because we know they're in a different lifestyle than we ever came up with. And I think this is one of the last really good things we can give to them. So, thank you. Thank you. Chris? So, last year we asked for $50 more in the assessment. This year we asked for 75 With a commitment to our members that once we had cleared the deferred maintenance from past boards that were delayed, once that was cleared, that we would take this money and ensure that we maintain our facilities and do the repairs in a timely manner so that they don't cost more money. That way, we would be able to keep our facilities at a high level. You know, we want outstanding facilities. We don't want them crumbling. Uh, that, so that's on the operations side which is where the assessment money comes in. For the big ticket items, the more expensive things that we want to do, I think we need to follow the processes that Long Range Planning and the Budget Committee have put in place so that we can make planful and informed decisions about what we choose to do and it becomes self-evident to the members why we are doing it. I think that's really, really important. I have listened to many comments over the last week, and that is the one thing I hear repeated no matter what position you're in. That is the one thing that I have heard. We need to make planful, informed decisions that keep the membership fully informed, and when the decisions are made, the reason for those decisions are self-evident. Thank you. Okay, next, I saw John step up. I'm sorry, oh, I thought I got, did I miss somebody? No, okay, sorry. No, I got to everybody. Okay. Don't scare me like that, John. Because I, I check, I do you checks. Got, you got me scared about it. Preamble, I was just gonna say thank you. No, 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 I got, I mean, I have checks. When somebody gets talking, I check them off. Okay. This is for all the board members, and Tom, thank you for bringing up the business case. Um, philosophy that I, th I thought was wonderful. I think it's a giant step forward. My question to each of you is do you think it's prudent to run 
the current expenditures of over $28 million through the business case because they were never run through that. Thank you. Okay. Um, Tom, you're up on this one for first. Well, John, um, the 28 millions is kind of O&M. Did you, were you referring to capital? Yes. Okay. So if we're talking about anything that's like 300,000 on 15 year life, yes, it goes through the business case, absolutely. Um, the other expenditures that are coming through the other side of the kind of the, the capital budget, which is the SIF side, mm -hmm. I think you're familiar with that as well. You gonna clarify? Could I clarify? You can clarify okay, sorry. quickly. Go ahead. Yes, I'm, I'm talking specifically the PAC, the Mountain View Renovation, and the Best Friends Dog Club. Mm. Okay. Um, I don't know that that's fair. Those decisions for the majority of those items were previous years, P PT, prior to Tom. So, but you wanted to ask questions, you asked a question with regards to the expenditures. So can you clarify that question? Yeah. Would you support running those decisions that weren't uh, run through the business case, through the business case, and if they change your mind, would you change your mind? What, there is a, let me just take a moment. There is a process that was established by our long range planning committee that any large expenditure go through basically a form that explains why it's needed, how it's needed, what's involved, you know, if it's a building, how big does it need to be? What does it need to hold? What's the purpose? That type of thing. Um, I, and John, I, I guess, and I would just state, those are already items that were approved in the budget. To go backwards, I guess I would say, is not gonna accomplish anything. But no, 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 I'm, you're, you're, you're done asking questions. I'm gonna let, them, I'm gonna let the rest of them address it. Yes. Don't, I would appreciate it if you don't answer the question. I'm not, I just explained to the nice lady and I'm not going to. Okay, so on my list then, the next person is Anita. Oh, thank you. Um, John, I know where you're coming from and I understand your question. Uh, would I take those projects and run them through now? And my answer is no. Um, those are prior projects that have been approved and we've been there and we've done that. But I, I support putting any new project, anything that comes up now through that process. Okay, um, the next person would be John. John, I'm gonna have to back off this one. I'm not familiar with the program. Okay, I'm not that familiar with the finances or the business plan, I'm sorry. Okay, then we'll move on to Chris. So I guess my question is how do you unring the bell? How do you unring the bell? So with regard to the PAC, Mountain View, the Best Friends Dog Club, those things have already been voted on and passed with the exception of the PAC, I will say. But well, actually, so whether there should be a PAC, my understanding is with the Mountain View vote, there was an agreement there should be a PAC. So Mountain View and the PAC seemed to be, I went back and listened to the SAC because several people raised that. And there did not seem to be much disagreement that there should be some kind of performance arts component there. So my question, would, my answer would be, would I delay Mountain View to put it through a business use case? Probably not. But would I say it sh everything coming forward from, from, we have the business use case now, everything coming forward? Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you. Mike? Yeah, well this is a little difficult for me just from the standpoint I haven't seen this form exactly, so it's something new to me. Um, but in general, I guess it's kind of hard to sit here and think about this without having all kinds of wild comments here, but the way Mountain View was approved three years ago, 
versus what it looks like today, as far as I'm concerned, are two different things. What was approved by the board, uh, there was a there was a pack, there was a gymnasium, there was a, 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 a design, I mean, a conceptual design. So in light of the fact that we still haven't figured out what Mountain View is gonna look like, uh, meaning it looks like there's an attempt to pull the pack out of the middle of Mountain View, okay, what goes in its place? I mean, I don't know that you could really say that you have an approval on Mountain View, because it's pretty obvious to me from the 30,000 foot view, and again, I haven't been in these meetings for two years, that there really isn't a design or doesn't appear to be a design for Mountain View. And I know that's what they're trying to do is figure where can the pack go so that we can go back to working on Mountain View. So if you're gonna change the design, if there's not gonna be a gymnasium, and I'm not saying there is or isn't, if there's not gonna be a pack on the property, I mean, why wouldn't you run it through the business case? Because it's treated like a clean slate. Because now maybe it's a $20 million project instead of a 40 or something. So again, that's just me with a 30,000 foot view looking at something I haven't been involved in in, in some time. Thank you, and Rick? Yeah, I've, I've, I've got a certain level of ignorance of this too because kind of like what Mike was saying, I haven't seen a definitive plan that this, this is what's going forward. Um, and I've just, actually I just started reviewing, I went into, and I wanna, I wanna thank the rec centers for all the data you put on the website because I'm looking at the SAC. And the, the work that, from my perspective, the little bit that I've looked at, and it's not thorough, the, the people involved in that were, did a fantastic job, and, and it seems like they came out with some results that have been somewhat disregarded. I don't understand that. I can say on the, on the financial side, I, I think everything needs to come down to review. Uh, you, you make a budget, okay, are you, are you, when you start moving in that, is, is, is the, are the bids out and are you getting enough bids? Everything's gotta be thorough, everything's gotta be done effectively as if it was my own money. And believe me, if I'm gonna spend my own money, I, I'm gonna be thorough and even more so, if I'm gonna spend your money, I, I have a fiduciary responsibility to really be thorough. And I look at, again, coming from government, government can tax you and take your money and spend it however they want. Uh, it's the same with the rec centers, only it's not a tax, it's an assessment fee. But as, as a board, we need to be aware that we have a fiduciary responsibility to everybody that we, in essence, tax, and we have to maximize that money. And I'll just say one other thing, just, this is part of my ignorance that I'm del delving into. I've looked at some of our budget stuff and I looked at a, a projection of what's supposed to be on coming in from the PIF. So I divided that number out by what we get from the PIF and it's like, ooh, we gotta have over 2,000 homes sell every year. And then I looked at what, what, what's our sales so far this year, our, our sales, and I checked with the realtor just to verify, uh, 12, 1,280 homes. Thank you. Far short. Okay, next question. Okay. Hello. <laughs> <sighs> okay. I've been on the board for four years, and we usually try to get 1,500. That's our number, magic number for PIF. No preamble, what's your question? Oh. <laughs> yeah. See, now you just made me forget it, I'm old. You can always come back. Um, I'm gonna sit down for a second until I okay. remember. Okay, all right, so Norm, we have to wait and see if anybody else has questions. I mean, come on guys, you came here for a reason. All right, um, so wait a second, Susan, all right. I actually had a different question, but I'm gonna follow up on John's question to you, Mike. So when you were on the board and you had that six million carryover, is there anything that you would have done differently with respect to the I wanna use the term neglect and maintenance because that's what it is, but I'll use deferred. Deferred maintenance that happened during 
uh, your time on the board, and I know you are the vice president, not directly responsible for um, managing management. What's your question, Susan? No my preamble. Qu my question, I asked him. Right. Is there something different that you would have done instead of saving that six million uh, carry forward? Uh, how would you have? How, would you go back and do anything differently? Thank well, you. Well, I, I mean, initially I'm going to say no, based on what. First of all, I never heard the term deferred maintenance until a year or two ago, okay? The entire time I was on the board, uh, I know when we hired uh, Mike Whiprood and we had Chris Herring, uh, there was, they had already developed a, what they called a PM schedule, preventative maintenance schedule. I don't ever recall during my time on the board there being any discussion about, oh geez, there's all this stuff that we're not fixing. I mean, yeah, there was always something that crept up and maybe we looked at it and said, uh, maybe we could have gotten in front of it a little sooner. But the, I, it, it wasn't like a deliberate attempt, we're gonna run around Sun City and, and neglect the RCSE facilities. I sat in front of Jan Eck and Bill Cook and Chris Herring on a very regular basis. And all I ever heard, you know, I mean, they would, I, I saw the, the uh, what were they called, work orders coming through. I sat on the properties committee when we identified something that needed to be done. Mike Ripper was sitting there, oh, there's already a work order. Barry was sitting there, there's already a work order. Now, I want to make a comment about this whole thing with deferred maintenance. Matthew sat right here in this auditorium here, I think about three months ago, and tried to explain away the whole deferred maintenance thing. And I'm not going to try to put words in his mouth, but he, he sat here and kind of explained that it's kind of sort of not really deferred maintenance. And I'm like, okay, then what is, I'm looking at it like, okay, what is it? You're running around telling everybody there's $20 million or the maintenance that hasn't been done. And then just recently I saw a list for the deferred maintenance and one of the line items on there was Thank replacing you, automobiles. Thank you, Mike. Well, that's not deferred maintenance. So I'm not really sure where Mike. all that came from. Okay. Thank you. The bell rang. You might not be able to hear it. Okay. I didn't. I'll tell you what, hang on a sec. I didn't hear it. It's a new bell. I broke the old one at a board meeting. <laughs> okay. Um, I saw, or you figured out what it was? Yeah. Okay, and then, then Connie is after you. It's a simple question. Okay. Now, you, you, I've been on the board for four years, and you never really get a good, solid reading on what the residents of this community want. And my question to you is, do you, do, would you support a PAC? Yes or no? Um, that's too similar to a previous question and we, we it's said a, no. It's, do you want one? Um, okay, I'm getting a shrug, so I guess I will allow, do you support a PAC? I got John Connie's next, so she hasn't been asked a question yet, but let's go ahead and go with this. I really don't think that this is fair, but Connie, or Karen says go for it. John, you were first up on this one. Thanks. I was hoping I'd get this one. Uh, <laughs> I don't know enough about both sides yet. I've been hearing about it. Okay, I've sat in a couple of meetings and they were kind of hostile, so that tells me there's a lot of emotion on both sides. So to say I would support it, I can't say that right now, and I'm not going to say I couldn't support it right now. I want to know more about it before I, I would make, I just don't have a, that kind of information yet. And thanks, Steve. Thank you. Okay, Chris? So do I pr support some kind of performing arts center? Yes. 
Okay, that's that's your response. Wonderful, um, Mike. Yes. Yes. Ah, short, sweet, to the point. Okay, Rick. One, I'll say I'm not opposed to it. For me, it comes down to, and again, going into the findings from the the SAC. Uh, there seems the numbers that they had, including the, the numbers of the people that were interested, it seems like a, a positive thing. But I'm just not going to say I support it regardless, because if you want to spend it, put it here and spend uh, 16 million or 16 million dollars on just this one little area and not really have the building complete. No, it's 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 all in. What does that include? Where is it at? There's a whole big, it's just like, you want to get married. Yeah, but it's going to be the right person. I'm not going to just take somebody, you know, it's, so to just say, do you support it without having all the details? And to me, that's what it should come down to uh, is, you know, what's, what's the full plan? What's the full cost? And then what's the input from the community? What are the numbers? It's all data driven. For me, it's got to be data driven. Thank you. All right, Tom. Well, part of our mission statement is that um, RCSC is to provide members with a wide range of uh, high quality amenities. I would think that a performing arts center would fall into that category. So I guess I am not opposing a, a performing arts center, but, but we do have some questions to, to get ironed out about that in the future here. Thank you, Anita. Uh, do I support a PAC? Uh, yes, I do. Uh, we've got great sporting facilities, we have great club facilities, and I think we have short uh, shortened our, our not given enough interest into our performing arts groups and our theater groups and our music groups. I think it's their time, they've been waiting 25 years. If you look at our articles of incorporation, even back then, Del Webb said we would have a theater. And I, I think it's time. Um, are we going to build something that's totally out, out of line and cost? Absolutely not. It has to fit certain parameters, contain certain things, and, and meet our financial status that we have now. Thank you. Okay, Connie, I saw you stand up and move. Not this Connie, that Connie. Some of you know I've been on different committees and worked with a lot of different clubs. My question is, is when you get to the end of the year, or whenever it happens, you send out a form and ask the clubs to, it's like a wish list. What would they like to have? What do they need? You ask them to prioritize it. And I personally want to know from each one of you, if you would consider safety first on their requests, because safety is a big issue. We know that there's clubs that need ventilation, you know, flooring, different things that are safety things. So when you come up with your $6 million or whatever it is at the end of the year, can you tell me, yes or no, that you would remember all the 130 some clubs we have and not just keep thinking pickleball, tennis, lawn bowling, golf, yes or no? And I'll ask Mike first. Um, that was actually who's on my list. So, okay. we'll so go you, for that. So do you want, do you, Ken, it's okay if I go with the rest of my order? Sure. All right, then. Mike, down. it is. Uh, yes, ab absolutely. I mean, we're, we got to take care of our, our members and I mean, safety is paramount. We all have a, a duty and a responsibility to keep people safe. Okay, is that that's your response? Anything else? I, I don't know if you heard my answer. Um, Connie, did you hear his answer? No. <laughs> Steve, you leave her alone. Yeah, you too. He let, go ahead and repeat it real quick. But I, I just said yes. I mean, absolutely, we have a duty to keep people safe, keep our members safe, and so yes, absolutely. Okay, thank you, um, Rick. I just want to make sure you're listening, I'm waiting for you. 
listen to me, not Steve. Uh, no, I, as far as I'm concerned, I wouldn't wait for the end of the year. I mean, that's a priority. Safety is, is a priority and not just, I mean, not that I don't care about people. We, we need to protect our, our residents, but also we have insurance to pay. And so the more issues that we have come up, that's gonna increase our costs. So it's, it's kind of a plus plus. We win on the financial insurance side, but, but also we win on the human side. So I don't, I don't think safety is something you wait until you see if you've got a, a little leftover. Uh, that's kind of take a little higher priority than just waiting to see if we got any money left over that we haven't spent. Thank you. Tom? I'm finding it hard to disagree with Mr. Gray. Um, the safety is a high priority, the, and, but it, so I guess the, the situation is that we will be allocating a certain amount of funds each year for the clubs. Um, but safety would have a high priority amongst whatever the clubs thought they needed to do so that it does have an insurance ramifications uh, and, and your comment about the ventilation and things of that nature, that's a very high priority. It needs to be addressed if we can, club by club, and see if that can't be addressed just to avoid the situations of um, some sort of liability that might come up because we didn't provide an adequate uh, facility for our members. If the situation is that there is more demand for uh, safety projects than has been allocated to the clubs, then things get more difficult. And somebody else is gonna have to give something up in order for the club to be able, to, or all of the clubs to be able to be addressed. And that goes back to our constant balancing act of unlimited wants and limited resources. And we're heavy on the limited resources, I'm afraid. Um, but we would just have to say something else doesn't get allocated, it's gonna have to wait a year or whatever if there is something of higher priority that needs to happen now. Thank you. Anita? Connie, are you talking about club budget requests? Is that where you're, okay. Uh, my first comment, if it's the end of the year and we've got $6 million left, something's wrong. We should have spent it long ago. Um, if we have safety issues in clubs, I'm not sure that should be in a club's request. I think administration should have taken care of that long ago. We have a safety and compliance department and that should be looked at long before a club would have to ask for it. However, the clubs now have a capital budget which they've never had before. And the COC committee takes all of these requests and reviews them, prioritizes them, and decides what gets done first and second. I would always, put a priority on safety, but there's different kinds of safety. If safety means your club members are breathing um, gases, that's number one. If it means you have a solvent in your club that might, could cause a problem, maybe we should remove the solvent until we can get you a cabinet that would be suitable for that solvent. So it kind of depends on what it is. And um, now that we've got that budget, I think we can do a lot more, but I think administration also needs to look more at some of the safety requirements. And I know that's pretty much number one on their list. Thank you. Chris? So um, I know from talking with management that as they're with this new process where there's money specifically set aside for the clubs, that safety is prioritized. However, I think the bigger part of your question is would we treat all clubs equally? So that we don't, you know, for me, safety is first. I think all clubs should be treated equally when it comes to that. It doesn't matter 
what the name of your club is, if you have a safety concern or a safety issue, that should go to the top of the list. It just should because we have to take care of the safety of our members. We just do. To me, that's non negotiable. Thank you. John? That question kind of hits home to me. And I hope you don't mind. I kind of relate something here. I told you I work for the California Department of Food and Agriculture. Three and a half years into my time there, they moved us out of a building because it had asbestos. They knew it for almost eight years before they moved us out of that, best, that uh, building. Two years ago, I had a partial lung removed, okay? So yeah, I support safety immediately. And uh, I would say that it's up to the clubs. Bring that forward when you see it. Don't wait for the end of the season. Something happens, uh, there's people that, Steve and others that run those clubs, they need to tell them and bring it up. But yeah, that's, that's paramount with me. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Let's see here, let me make sure. I got everybody, right? Okay, just wanna make sure, because I was getting looked at like I missed somebody. Are there any other questions? Because otherwise, I've got one. Ah, oh, hi there. Good evening, Lori Ellingson. J.P. Morgan says the first steps towards getting somewhere Lori, is to decide no, you're no not preamble. going to stay where you are. My question okay. is, do you feel that RCSC has fallen behind in changes and are they keeping current with the trends of today? As you know, measure of intelligence is the ability to change. So my question is, do you feel that the RCSC has changed with the current times? Okay, all right. Rick, you get first shot at that one. I'm still kind of mulling over. I, I guess my focus hasn't been, um, is Sun City keeping up with the times? I mean, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a tech person, so I like, I like my technology. Um, I think, you know, we're moving in that direction. I, again, my, uh, just to be honest, my highest priority is do we have a community that is taking care of the residents in that community the way it needs to, and do we have a financial process that we're going through that will give us security as we move forward? So, you know, pickleball, well, everybody's going pickleball, well, we got pickleball courts now. That's great, but do we have the financial base and the strategy? Are we doing everything so that in the future, we don't, it's just like when you get older, you don't wanna to have to run out of money before you run out of time. Well, I think it's the same with, with the, the rec centers. We need to make sure that we are on a financial path, that we're providing the things that we need, we're maintaining our, and growing as a community, but we're also on a solid fiscal path. Um, so that's my priority, I don't know if that really answers what you want, but uh, again, that's, that's, that's my focus and my direction. Okay, thank you, Rick. Tom? Well, I would say um, you're never really always up to, up to date or, or keeping, keeping pace, but, but we're trying. And as you may well aware uh, that we did this, it was kind of before my time, but I certainly have gone through these documents, this uh, Arizona State survey that we took to try to get some feedback from not only our residents, but people who might consider coming here in the future. And there were a lot of things there that, that came forward of, you know, social spaces and, um, walking paths and golf and pickleball and a variety of different things that might attract future residents to Sun City. So that information can be valuable as far as long range planning of what we want to see Sun City evolve to. Uh, and I think that that certainly uh, has been taken into consideration as we've looked at some of these things. But, but again, a longer range, dynamic plan for the whole 
uh, city, or excuse me, the whole rec centers takes time. Uh, the other side of that coin is what we've already kind of touched on a little bit, and that's this budget process and the, tran uh, the transparency of that process, and then the ability that when we are going to move forward with a capital budget, that we've done our due diligence, it's gone through these business cases, there is good evidence that we've put together that this is a prudent expenditure of your and my funds in order to make Sun City a better place tomorrow. Thank you. All right, um, where'd I leave off? Okay, Anita. Okay, um, Lori, I'm not sure we have kept up with the times right now. We've got, uh, our technology is slightly lacking, but we're working on it. We have a ton of deferred maintenance that we need to catch up on. I think we're at a point where, with the income we have, we can maintain what we have. But if we want to expand, we're going to have to expand income. I don't know if that's going to come just from fee assessments, annual assessments, or if it's just going to come from the PIF, or if the foundation's going to get lucky and find $20 million somewhere. Um, we, we can't necessarily grow our programs unless we grow our revenue. So there's, we're kind of caught in a place, but I think we're turning the corner. I think we're open to ideas where before maybe that wasn't there from what I've heard in the past. Um, I know I'm open to new ideas. We just have to figure out a way to fund it. Thank you. Mike? Well, it, it's another one of those yes and no questions. Yes, we've done a good job of recently since the ASU survey of identifying some things that, that the community would like to have. And it's kind of ironic that that survey was a couple of years ago and I don't think that we've ever, you know, had the opportunity to, to act on any of it yet. But, um, you know, define technology, right? I mean, we've we been working to improve our Wi-Fi and, uh, and the connections within the rec centers, but at the same time, you know, there's some other activities that we don't seem to keep up with. So I know it sounds like an odd answer, but it, it's kind of a, it is a yes and no. Uh, number one, awareness is the first step in, in solving a problem. And I'm hoping here in the near future, we can start acting on some of the things that the community would like to, like to see. Thank you. Uh, John? You talked about trends. Were you talking, may I ask, can I ask a question? To clarify the question for me? Okay, I lost who it was that asked the question. Lori. 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 Were you talking about financial trends or trends to progress to get more entertainment, more athletic things? I, keeping, I think keeping Sun City, are we keeping current? So, yeah. Right. Okay, Lori, they're not going. The people online are, are not going to be able to hear you. So, so. I'm just curious, what what trends are you looking at, please? Um, making changes so that we don't go out of business. So that we. Um, Club Med was first designed in 1950. It was the first all-inclusive resort. Del Webb was the very first re 55 mm -hmm. retirement community. Club Med has made a lot of changes in allowing children and okay. families. I think I think so, he's got the idea. Yeah. So, so that that's do, you want to know do we need to make changes so that people want to move here okay. as a retirement community as opposed to people wanting to move here because it's cheap. Okay. Okay, Lori, thank, thank you for the clarification. All right, John? Okay, yeah. We're gonna give you two minutes since. Oh, that's okay. Uh, no, I, I definitely agree that we have to keep up with the other 55 and over communities around the United States, not just here. 
And um, if that means we have to work more on our budget, okay, we do that. If we want to bring in a lot of things, and we're going to have to figure that the people that want them, it's going to come out of us. We are the people, you know, funding it. So we have to, it moves on every day, everywhere. If we see something, and this is a great time for people, you see something in another community that is so great and you really like it, let us know about it. And then uh, I believe then we go out and we see, would it work here? It may not work here, but if it does, maybe we can implement it. And again, we have to go with the budget on it because finance drives a lot of what we do. And uh, what the people want is what we have to go with. And we all know the trends have changed from tennis balls, playing tennis to <laughs> everything else we do here. And uh, I would like to see you know, a lot of different things come around and we stay up with what everybody else is doing. And you're right, it would be nice to you know, have all people of all financial backgrounds, all financial retirements be able to be here and get things that they enjoy. And that takes input from the people also for us to do it. Thank you. Chris? So, um, I'm actually not on any clubs or committees. The only committee I was on was the technology committee. And I started on that when it started. And I can tell you, at that point in time, we were 15 years behind in technology. We were using technology from the 90s. Significant improvements have been made since then. Through the work of the committee, driving some of that, through the management driving some of that, through the board driving some of that. So there are, so if you ask, are we always keeping up with the times? No. And I would also argue that to a certain extent, just by the simple fact of our age, we tend to be more change averse than the regular, the average population of the United States. That is a, the nature of aging, right? We tend to be more change averse. So we are more cautious in making changes. Do I think we can do a better job of watching the trends, listening to some of the younger members perhaps of our community or perhaps why people pass us over? Right? So I'm not coming here because this isn't here. Maybe we could do a better job of that. Certainly the SU survey would indicate we're looking for more social spaces, more community engagement, um, more of a community feel. Uh, I've heard people say, I would like to have something other than folding chairs. I would like to have something other than tables or airport, airport seating when I go places. Those are all things that have been shared with me. There are others that tell me I'm just fine with that. So it's a balance. It's a balance with meeting the needs, but the number one thing we have to watch is there's only so much you can ask the members to contribute before you tap them out. And that has to be considered as well. Okay, thank you. All right, does anybody have a question? Okay, I see you, because otherwise we're gonna wrap this up with closing statements. So these are second questions. Okay, hold on just a second. Does anybody have a first question? Okay, then you get this first second question. First second. And then do you still want it to be everybody or? Yes, this question is for everybody. Okay. Um, I understand some of you are retired, some of you are working, and I'm wondering how, uh, if you're working, how you reconcile your uh, full-time job or a, a big job with all of the board daytime responsibilities. Okay, let's go ahead with, um, had this lined up. Mike, can you answer that first? Sure, I'm working full-time. Uh, I work in a laboratory environment to where uh, my hours are very flexible. I can go work two 20-hour shifts. Uh, it's, I'm, I'm part of a team, but it's not like we're all sitting in a line doing our work. So I've worked it out with my employer that I can come and go at will. All they care about is I get so many of these things made. Actually, I only have to make one of them a month, but it, it's, you know, it's pretty easy for me to be flexible with my time. Okay, thank you, Chris. So, um, part of the reason last year I considered joining the board, and I didn't because I worked full time. My job um, was very demanding, and I did not feel like I could give 
the community, the members, the right level of commitment to be on the board. So I did not become engaged with the board until I retired on March 1st. Because for me it was really important that I, it have my full commitment because I had already talked to many of the board members and they talked about how many hours it takes, the commitment, the extra work that you have to do. So for me it was really important if I was gonna do this, I was gonna do it right. So I'm fully retired now and I'm able to commit whatever number of hours and some weeks it's less and some weeks it's way more. It just, it's the nature of the job. Thank you. Anita? Um, uh, I'm retired from my real job, but then I took this job and I'm full time again. Um, uh, being on the board, uh, depending on your commitment, you, you can spend a lot of time. It's not just sitting at a meeting. There's a lot of homework. There's a lot of research. There's a lot of meeting with people. So am I retired? I'm, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Not sure. <laughs> Thank you. Rick? Yes, I, I am retired in that I don't have a job. Um, so I do look forward to uh, spending whatever time I need on this board. Uh, one of the things I'm looking forward to is uh, one of the things I appreciate is learning. And when you're put into a situation where you've got certain requirements, it's, it's a learning experience. So uh, I'm not only looking forward to investing time, but I'm also looking forward in, into a great learning process. And then also, I've also found that being on boards, you begin to work with people and, and um, for me, one of the best things about being on a board is the people you get to work with. So uh, I will be spending plenty of time here, I'm sure. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, John? Yes, I'm, retri I'm retired twice. Okay, and I fully understand that this is a long hours, a lot of days, job, and uh, I really look forward to doing it. I, I have the time, uh, otherwise I'd be spending my time golfing, and I'm not very good at that. So, I, I do have the time available, I'm not working. Thank you. Thank you. All right, make sure, Tom. You know, my friends ask me often, you know, how do you like retirement? And, and my response is, when I actually retire, I'll let you know. Um, I would say I spent a lot of time on the board, doing board work, and when I was elected president, it became a little bit heavier commitment, and I'm fine with that. Um, I am in the board's offices pretty much every day. I have meetings with the general manager pretty much every day. There's always a crisis somewhere about something <laughs> practically every day. So I, I would not um, tell anybody who was interested in serving on the board, oh, it's, you know, 10 hours or, you know, a couple meetings a month, because it's not. It takes a pretty, a, a pretty severe time commitment, and if you're not willing to give it what it takes, maybe you should, well, not not worry about running for the board. Hey, thank you. Okay, now I saw two or three people standing up. Um, let's give him a, a chance. Thank you. Again, I'm Jim Stark, and Anita said something a few minutes ago that I thought was dead on target, that growth means more revenue. If you're gonna grow, you gotta have more revenue. And I'd like to hear from the board members what they think about the other side of that equation of finding where we can reduce costs, where we can reduce programs, or perhaps eliminate programs, and maybe save our members a few bucks. Okay, I'll love that one. Um, Mike, you're first up on that one. Well, yeah, that's a that's a always the tough question. You know, what do you what do you give up? What do you sacrifice? Um, you know, one of the things we got to look at long and hard, I think, is you know what we're charging you know outside people to come into the community to golf, and I'm a, I don't golf, but I'm a big fan of it, and, and uh, 
you know, we, we, we just got to manage our money. We've, we've got to keep ourselves competitive uh, with the help of Showa and, and the Posse and all. We have a really clean and, and safe community, which helps keep our property values up. Um, I think we need to do a better job of, of marketing ourselves because there's still a lot of people out there who don't seem to know we're here. But, uh, but at the end of the day, it's just it's managing our, our resources and, and managing our money. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Rick? Yeah, the other day I said there's two things that I really like, one's strategic planning and one's efficiency. And I think and Mike touched on it. We, you know, when we're looking at where we spend our money, we need to look at is that the most effective? Are we getting the biggest bang for the bucks? When it comes to contractors, are we maximizing our RFA, RFPs? Are we, are we really honing down to where we're getting everything we want at the lowest possible price? That's just efficiency with money. And, you know, I can't tell you we could do this, this, and this because I haven't been into the budget that, that, that deep enough yet. But I think that's where we need to be. That's where we need to go. And again, everything's got to be data driven, but we do need to, and, and to kind of go back to being the best, uh, and I've, I've said this the last time too, our mission statement is to be the best of the 55. Well, that's not what I think is necessary because there's a lot of 55 plus that are spending thousands of dollars a month in cost to their, their community. We need to be the best that we can be, driving the most efficient that we can, we can with our finances so that we can maximize all the, all the benefits that we can get from every dollar that we have. And I think, again, that's, that's gonna be a process. And I look forward to working on that. Thank you. Tom? Well, I don't disagree generally with what Rick just said, however, I guess I would caution a little bit about when you do RFPs and you get the lowest bid, and maybe you've had these um, experience with this like I've had, that sometimes the lowest bid is the lowest for a reason. Um, and sometimes the lowest bid is not the most cost effective way to do. So you have to take things with a little bit of a grain of salt to make sure that that what the part that I do agree with is get the biggest bang for your buck. But that, so that doesn't always mean the lowest cost bidder is the most effective one. So beyond that though, what are we doing? I, 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 so the revenue side is very important and we're looking at other ways to try to raise revenues and Anita was talking about foundation uh, things and but we're also looking at things that clubs can do to raise funds that they can then use those funds to help themselves rather than depending on RCSC to always fund their uh, their needs. So that's the revenue side. But the expense side, for instance, just look at golf, if you will, and how much we're spending on fertilizer and herbicides and so on and so forth, but we're looking now at putting in different kinds of turf in, in our golf courses that will save water, be more heat resistant, play better. It's not that we're trying to be Augusta National here, but we're trying to be something that is a reasonable playing surface that will attract not only residents to come here, but outside residents whom I'm thrilled to death have they for them to come, but I intend to be compensated when they come. So that's another source of revenue. Thank you. Thank you. Anita? Uh, we just went through the budget process and uh, I can tell you there's not a lot of fat in that budget. It's pretty tight. Uh, we have fixed costs that we can't do anything about. We, you know, we have to pay for the lights, we have to pay for the water, that's just there. Taxes, property taxes are property taxes. We have no control, our insurance went through the roof this year. We're kind of at the mercy of the Arizona Department of Water Resources and whatever they decide they're going to do to us. Um, some of these things are, are costs beyond our control. We are at a point, we have eight rec centers and eight golf courses and we're squeaking through. We're staying, we're not bankrupt. We're going to have to decide, are we going to continue to have every program we have or 
are we going to raise our rates to continue to have that? With inflation, another thing we have no control over, I, I'm very pleased we're doing what we are doing. But sooner or later, I think we're going to have to increase our revenue somehow, somewhere. Thank you. Chris? So, I agree with Anita that we have to look at other sources of revenue to help offset some of our costs. But I also understand where there has to be some kind of cost benefit analysis to determine what is meeting the greater good. That's always difficult because it's not as simple as a cost benefit analysis because every CBA you do that says don't do this, this is a group of members that are being impacted and the commitment that the corporation made to them for them to be able to do those things. So it becomes very difficult to make those decisions. But I do think you know, part of the things of staying with the times is recognizing when something has gotten to the point where it is, it has met his time and expired. And then do we continue to provide that when it has met his time and expired? Or do we make the difficult decision that no, we have to actually say this has met its time, it has expired. It's a hard decision to make and it's probably one of the most difficult ones that the board makes is making those decisions. I think if we can't increase revenue and we don't want to increase charging to charges to the membership, those may, down the road, be some of the difficult decisions that have to be made. Thank you. Okay, so looking at the time, we basically have time for one more question. Norm, he actually raised his hand first, I'm sorry, Norm did. So, so Norm, just, Norm, just give me a heads up. If you can let them raise their hand if they want to answer it, we probably can get someone else's question in too, but we will not have time for closing statements. Okay, I want to get away from the area of finance because that's always a problem. What I'd like to get into is what do you think in the next 10 years the two best building projects should be to meet the dual requirement of meeting the members' needs and expectations and attracting new residents. Um, okay, all right, I got the go ahead. All right, so based on that, and this will take us to just about the eight o'clock hour. Um, where am I? Let's go with, Trying to find which line I left off at. Let's go with um, Tom. You get to start off with that one. Ouch. Awesome. Um, okay. So, w what two would I kind of rank relatively high? Um, Lakeview itself is something that we need to think about that site per se. And, and so thinking about one of the things that we, that we have concerns about here is parking. And, and I think that when some of these sites were in initially developed, you know, Sun City wasn't all that big a place. And so parking wasn't such a, a concern. But as you build facilities on these sites, there are parking requirements that we sometimes cannot meet and that eliminates certain sites. So one of the things we might have to take a hard look at is some other way to provide parking uh, in order to free up surface space for other facilities. That might mean there's a parking ramp in our future somewhere. Those are not inexpensive. But if, if we can't meet certain parking requirements, then we either need more surface space, buy more land, or, or we're gonna just not be able to build the facilities that we want. 
The second thing to think about is, is Mountain View itself. It, it, that facility is very old, unfortunately. I was just there the other night. Um, it, it, we need to look hard at that. I know it's been something that's been kicked around for years and years and years, but certainly it's something that I think has to be high on the list of priorities in order to, in, to build a Sun City that will attract and retain the kind of folks we're looking for. Thank you. Uh, Anita? Uh, number one on my list is Mountain View. Um, it's time. It, um, I live in that area. Uh, it's a, um, an eyesore. I, I don't think it's a good representation of what Sun City is or could be. So Mountain View would be number one on my list. Number two on my list would be something that's pretty much come out of the ASU survey. And that is they're looking for a community area, a community center where people can go and enjoy uh, visiting with people, we, I think we need something for children periodically. I think it's a great place to put the pack because it pulls people into it. Uh, I think we need to review the whole Lakeview area. And uh, I know it's been mentioned we should do a, a study and I support that. Thank you. God, where'd I leave off? All right, um, John? Well, it's kind of hard to find other things besides Lakeview because that is a very important area that needs to be taken care of. Do you mean Lakeview or Mountain View? Just Mountain View, I'm sorry. Lakeview's here. Okay. Uh, my apologies. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it could use some work. Uh, the other thing is uh, a social center you know, where more people could get together, different clubs could get together with other clubs, uh, outside people invited to come in. You know, it's like a, you know, like a, like a pack, but I don't want to go there. And uh, just allow more people to come in and see what we've got, which could help people buying here and moving here. And so I think we kind of need to look at those two areas. Thank you. Thank you. Chris? So, um, sorry about that, guys. Um, Mountain View first. It has to be the priority. We've been offer, We've been sh telling our friends and neighbors in the Mountain View area that they're, we're gonna renovate, we're gonna do something, we're gonna do something. I don't live in at that side of town. We used to, but I don't now. I live um, near Lakeview. But we owe it to them to meet that commitment to them. We just plain do. And then, Again, going with the ASU survey, some kind of community center, social places, places where people, particularly that you're hearing from the lower end boomers and the Gen Xs that say, I want these social places. I want somewhere where I can go socialize with my friends. COVID changed how we socialized and we thought it was changed permanently, but it's not. It's, it's going back. It's moving back to where people are going out into social spaces and spending time together. The next, in the PIF forecast, the next logical place we look at is Lakeview. And Lakeview has a lot of that, has a lot to add to that sense of community, those community spaces, social spaces, things like that. So those are the two things, the two, Norm, you asked which ones. But with Lakeview, I do think we need to have a design. I don't think we just willy-nilly piece things here and there. Um, that is one of the, some of the member comments that I've heard that resonate. So I would say Mountain View first, thinking about social spaces, community, Lakeview being next up to bat, we look at how we can build that in. Thank you. Mike? Okay, so to echo what everybody's saying here is just that, I mean, Mountain View and then Lakeview. What I would like to see happen is kind of design both of them at the same time. Doesn't mean we gotta move dirt at the same time, 
but figure out which amenities belong where, because to the willy-nilly comment, it does seem like there's a lot of afterthought, and here we have a chance to do it right. You've got two properties, I'll call it identified on the, on the next up list, and if you're still trying to identify what you're gonna do with Mountain View, yeah, now's the time to take a good hard look at it. Some people call it a master plan. I think that might be a good description. But, you know, paper's cheap and moving things around on a, on a drawing versus, you know, building something and then wishing you'd have figured it out what it needed to be. Okay, thank you. All right, so that should just leave Rick. Yes. Okay. Yeah, it was, it's interesting because my wife and I just went through, uh, we hadn't been down to Mountain View for a little while, so we went down and, and perused that as well as the rest of the facilities. And yeah, obviously Mountain View is a, is a top priority. But I will say, just to say that we need to do something, my big default would be, but what? What's the plan? And, and I'll kind of tag on what, what Chris has said, which I fully believe. I come from a construction background. You don't just jump in and start doing something construction when you've got a whole other thing here. It, it, that's gonna end up costing you way more money. You need a strategic plan, you need a holistic plan, and then you do it sequentially in the way that is the most effective, least costive, costive, costive and do it in a way that it, it processes and goes smooth and it drives efficiency and it reduces cost. So yeah, I think obviously when you take a look at Mountain View, that's, I mean, I'm a big fan of working out. Their, their facility is horrendous. I can see why nobody goes there. I can see why aren't the numbers are so low. Um, but again, it's, it's not just, okay, we need to do this, so let's just jump in and do whatever. We, we need to have a plan. And again, some of the plans I've seen from the SAC, it is like, boy, that's, that's pretty interesting. But you know, we, we need to make a decision on that too. Okay, thank you. All right, so we ended that round a little bit earlier, so you are last. Just be aware, not everybody will be able to answer your question. <clears throat> I think they might. In one word, one adjective, what adjective, what does a successful board look like? Wow, okay. All right, that's a good one. Um, okay, with my last round, let me find a list here. Let's go with Anita. Oh. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'm trying to make it fair. Are you, uh, this is not fair. Um, <laughs> One word, a successful board. Can I give you two? <laughs> uh, respect and compromise. Okay, all right, so we gave Anita first. Um, Mike? Responsible. Chris? Effective. John? Honest. Rick? I really like to go more than one word, but uh, I'll say fiduciary. And Tom, you get to end the session. Well, I, those are a lot of good words, but I would throw into that mix consensus building. Okay. All right. I would like to thank everybody. What are you holding your hand up for? Okay, well it was two words. All right, I would like to thank everybody for being here. Um, I'd like to thank you all for your thoughtful questions. There are still some bunt cakes back there if you wanna grab one on your way out. Would you save me a lemon one this time? Okay, okay and we do have, so we do have um, a wonderful pianist that's gonna be setting up in a couple of minutes. This, for the next half hour, is kind of, um, the, we'll shoo these guys off the stage and you can corner them and ask them some individual questions if you want. Thank you again all for coming. Thank you.
be written production of the recreation centers of Sun City Incorporated and is intended for the sole purpose of informing our recreation center members. Any duplication, copying, transmission, broadcast or use including electronic and social media is strictly prohibited without the prior written consent from the recreation centers of Sun City Incorporated. Thank you for watching.